here today. I, I want to give a quick update on yesterday, Love the Rock. I know many of you were involved yesterday. For You, you may be a guest here today. Let me explain to you what took place. Uh, we started it back in 2014, and we've done it every other year. And yesterday was Love the Rock uh, for the whole community. And we saw probably 30-plus congregations of people come together. It was probably close to 800 people just loving on the city and just being there and working uh, projects as far as uh, schools, parks, um, Chisholm Valley, really, that was the area of uh, picking up and hauling stuff off and doing fire safety surveys and all of these kind of things. And it, it just blows my mind that, um, uh, in fact, uh, one of the crews out at uh, Old Settlers Park completely remulched the whole Frisbee golf course yesterday morning. It was crazy to see that. And, and uh, what made it so special, and, and this, the church supplies the manpower, and the city is so involved with us on this thing, they pick up the price tag on all the mulch and all the stuff that, that's taking place. It's an incredible uh, fitting together, and we get to go house to house, and we get to work in people's yards and pray over people, pray over principals of schools. It's just, it just blows my mind, and I want to thank you, Central, for being at the front of the line and, and, and uh, serving the way you do. And so it was a great day, uh, just a great to be outside, and I know some of you are a little sore today, and that's good. That's a good thing right there. If you have your Bibles I want you to, or your devices, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 12. We're going to be in John chapter 12 in just a moment. We, this is a, the final part, part four of a series we're calling Next Door, Loving Those Closest to You. And, and we've been talking about that we have been commanded by Jesus himself that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then part B of that was to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And we've been talking about this thing about loving our neighbors. How do we fulfill the command that Jesus had for us to love our neighbors? And the neighbors defined those in our sphere of influence that are closest to us. Uh, much of the time it is our neighbors in our neighborhood but it could be students that sit around you in school. It could be workmates that are around you at work. It could be at the soccer fields, at the uh, Little League fields, wherever it may be. Those people that are within your sphere of influence, how do we love them properly? And we've talked about that. We've talked about some of the barriers to uh, loving our neighbors. But today uh, is going to be continuation of last week as we talked about how do we bless our neighbors, B-L-E-S-S, -S, and you were given a card when you came in, uh, unless we ran out to, uh, uh, that have the acronym on there for bless, and we're going to uh, get into that. Before we read the scriptures, quick question, if you were locked out of your house and uh, you, you could not call your spouse, could not call your, uh, your parents or your kids, however that may work out. You're just locked out of your house. Uh, what, what would you do? I mean, would you, you, I know you'd walk around the house, you'd check every window to see if maybe one's unlocked, or go to the back door, and, and it, we got a doggy door on ours. You may try to crawl through that thing, and it's not going to, some of you wouldn't getting very far in, in the doggy door. And uh, so you, you try all different things. But then what would you do? Would you have to call a locksmith? What, what would you do? We have found ourselves in that position before. And uh, so what we have done is several of our neighbors have keys to our house. And uh, so we just call them or go over to their house and say, hey, we need to borrow our key to get in our house. And, uh, you know, I, you don't do every neighbor that way, but, but we've built relationships enough to trust them with our key. We had one situation one time. We're out of town. Somebody else in our neighborhood was coming down to take care of our dog, and they had misplaced the key to our house. 
So, uh, and we're out of town. So what do we do? We tell them, go across the street, get the key from Mike, and then come and unlock the door, and, and you're going to be fine. But, you know, you got to know your neighbors to build those kind of relationships that you trust them with a key to your house. And, and man, it's a great thing. We have keys to neighbor's house because they're, we reciprocate and, and do those kind of things. But that's just one step in, in loving them properly. And we're going to talk more about that today. But I want to go to John chapter 12. And I want us to look at um, this particular passage because I think that, that it's a situation out of the life of Jesus that speaks to uh, what we want to see accomplished with our neighbors. So John chapter 12 What's happened is, is Jesus has, this is his final time into Jerusalem. We've had the triumphal entry coming in, and now we find ourselves, Passover is going, in verse 20, we pick it up. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast, we're talking about Passover, that last Passover there, were some Greeks, Greeks or Gentiles, they were God-fearers, they were seeking truth, but they were not Jews. Verse 21, so these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Let's stop there. What's happening is, is that, like I just said, Jesus is his final trip into Jerusalem. The cross awaits him in a few days. He knows that. The people do not completely understand that because he's not been arrested yet. These Gentiles who are coming, they're, they're seeking God. They're, they feel like if they can come to Jerusalem, maybe experience what these Jewish people experience, the true living God, then maybe they will find God themselves. They had heard about Jesus. They knew about Jesus. They come to Philip. Why did they come to Philip? Uh, Philip is a, is a Greek name. Maybe they thought he has some Greek background. So they come and get Philip. Philip goes and gets Andrew. Uh, why did he get Andrew? I, you know, when we read the New Testament, all we can speculate is that Andrew was always bringing people to Jesus. I mean, that's just the way he was wired. You remember the little boy with the five loaves and two fish? Andrew brought him to Jesus. He was always, we're hearing about Andrew bringing people to Jesus. So maybe Philip thinks, man, he's always doing it anyway. Let's go get Andrew and let's let him uh, bring the people to Jesus. And so they come to Jesus. And this is what they ask. This is incredible question. Underline it circle it, whatever, it, 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 and here's the question. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. That's the question. I've, I've got a point that I want you to write down, and, and it's this. People today are seeking Christ followers who can show them Jesus. I really believe that we we live in a spiritually seeking age. Now, people don't know where to look. They, they it's not it's not like they're going to darken the door of a church. They are going to seek out those that are truly followers of His, those that are the real deal, and they're gonna they're gonna ask them, "Hey, show me Jesus. I, I, I know it's not you, but you take me to Jesus. You show me Jesus." And I think the people today are desperately looking. But what has happened, this is what scares me. I'm afraid that we as Christ followers have not given them enough life of Christ in us to be an attraction. 
I think we've given them religion, we've given them morals, we've given them many things, but listen, there is so much more that the life of Christ wants to display through us, and, and people are searching. And I think that's their question that we're, they're asking. Show me Jesus. And that's what my prayer always is on Sundays and building up to Sundays when we come together. Because there's something about having your own devotionals during the week, prayer and, and the Word. But when we come together, it's like coals that are burning. And it's not burning for us. It's burning for the sake of Jesus Christ. And I, I really pray that when someone comes here and they're searching that they don't find a religious system they don't find entertainment they find Jesus and and that's what they're saying Lord uh, show us Jesus that's what they're saying unto Philip hey show us Jesus we want to see Jesus and so they they bring them to Jesus and uh, and Jesus it seems like he seems to take a left turn as far as I'm concerned but this is the continuation because in verse 23 he said he answered them. And, and this is what he goes on. He goes on to uh, give them uh, some paradoxical statements, uh, things that don't seem to gel together. And, and he gives them this teaching. And in this teaching he is talking about his life. And he is, he's, he's talking about that he is going to be glorified. Well, how is he going to be glorified? He's going to be glorified when they nail him on a cross in a couple of days. But he gives three things that I want to give to you right quick before we get into very practical steps. And, and, and it's three things. This is what I call the Jesus paradox. First one is this. Death brings life. He talks about, this, uh, about a seed going into the ground, unless that seed is buried, it will not break forth and give fruit. Now, he's talking about himself. He says, I, I, you know, basically, I'm going to die on a cross, and i got to go through that, because if I don't go through that, I cannot break forth and give life to you. And so he, he gives us paradox that death brings life. In other words, glory from suffering. And we don't understand that in our day. Our world doesn't understand that. And Jesus is, is emphasizing that not only to, in himself, but in us as well. That when we die to this flesh, it's at that point that he can bring life forth. The next one is this. Giving leads to gain. He talks about the giving of himself that this will lead to gain. In other words, a fruitful life will come from death. And so this giving... When we give ourselves away, then we see gain. And there's a third one, right quick. Service leads to greatness. In other words, victory f comes from surrender. Service leads to greatness. So that's what I loved yesterday. Uh, I loved yesterday so much because we were serving. We weren't going to ask anything of anybody other than, how can we pray for you? That's what we were asking. And, and that's foreign in our day because everybody thinks that everybody has an agenda. And so when you're genuine and saying, we're just here because we care, people, it blows people away. But this is the paradox that Jesus gives. He, he gives a paradox that life comes from death, that gain comes from giving, and that the serving leads to success and they, this totally antithesis of our culture our culture says step on others so that you can be the top dog in the bunch we always have rankings because we want to know who's the top dog we want to know who's the best football team we want to know best basketball team we want to know the rankings of Forbes 500 we want to know these things because we we want to climb the ladder of success and along comes Jesus, and he says, it's through surrendering that you're going to find success. You see how different that is from the world? And we wonder why the world is confused about true, genuine followers of Jesus. That we give ourselves away, and the world cannot understand it. But that's what the paradox that Jesus brings forth. 
And if we're going to love our neighbors correctly, as Jesus wants us to love our neighbors, there's going to have to be this dying to self, there's going to have to be this giving ourselves away, and there's going to have to be surrender so that God can be exalted and we can love them properly. Remember I said we're not loving our neighbors because we put a notch in our Bible said, oh, I love that neighbor. Or that neighbor starts coming to church. Yeah, we'd love to see that. But we're loving them because Jesus commanded us to love them. Now, last week we talked about the acronym B-L-E-S-S. We talked about a begin with prayer last week. And we, I've given you the, the tic-tac-toe boards. How you doing with that? You learning any of your neighbors? Keep that in front of you. You're learning your classmates. You're learning those around you. Work that out. Last week, uh, uh, we, we made available the Bless Every Home to you, and uh, about 150 of you took, took us up on that. That's very good. That, and hopefully, you're getting your uh, text already and how you can pray for your neighbors. It gives you a prayer. I, I really think this. I, you know, that Bless Every Home, I get a text 8 o'clock in the morning, I, it gives me a prayer to pray for our neighbors. It gives me five neighbors to pray for. I'm thinking the only thing it's not doing is praying for me. I mean, it's laying it all out there. So it's a great tool to so begin with prayer and learn your neighbors. But here's the L in our acronym. The L is listen to them. Listen to the heart of your neighbor. Hear their struggles. Hear their woundings. See their passions. Know what they love. Know what they like. Listen to their needs. Whatever their needs may be. Maybe we live in a day where maybe their teenager has rebelled or they're going through some, some uh, health issues. But listen to what's going on. Find out what makes them tick. Be genuine and transparent and authentic. In, in your relationship with them. I have a neighbor, and uh, he used to be active in church as a young man. He went through something, life, life struggle he went through, and he got hurt by the particular congregation he was going through. And some of you have been in that boat, and I, I hate it when people get hurt through the body of Christ. But it happened to him and he's not darkened the door of the church since because he got hurt that way, teaching Sunday school and everything at the time. So I just love him. And uh, he a lot of times will come on and hear the services here. And so, you know, that's just hearing his heart. But we need to learn to discern we need to pray for a gift of discernment to know what's going on in their life. But here's a warning. Let me give you this warning when it comes to listen. Don't listen to judge. Maybe they don't, maybe their language is a little colorful. I hate that. Maybe it's foul. They're just foul mouth. Or maybe their lifestyle is not like yours. Maybe they drink too much. Maybe they're going through some kind of struggle. But if you're listening and you start seeing these things in their life and you start being judgmental, oh, they know it right off the bat. That's not genuine love. Allow God to change them. You love them. So that's my warning in that and see their soul listen listen with with your heart listen to their heart know what's going on so that's l listen e, -E is it the eat now we all love to eat and we all do eat and we do very well at eating but sometimes we don't and the reason that the term eat is used 
is most relationships are built around fellowship. How many times does somebody say, hey, can you meet me at the restaurant or can you meet me for a cup of coffee or something like that? Because the, the, the fellowship seems to go deeper around a meal or something similar to that. And, and uh, I, I, I ask this question because it may not be necessarily just inviting them to dinner, but it's doing something that's a little deeper than, than just an encounter on the street. Here's my question for you. Do your neighbors know what the inside of your house looks like? And I know some people will say, man, I want to even have family members inside of my house. <laughs> but do your neighbors know what the inside of your house looks like? That's, you want to get to that point where you have that kind of deeper fellowship with them. See the walls come down. Be genuine. Be authentic. S, the first S is serve. When you discover their needs, serve. Maybe you have older neighbors, maybe single moms, jobless people, sick or infirmed, but you don't know until you find out what's going on. <clears throat> I've shared this before that I have a philosophy that uh, an unkept yard, especially out of control, usually is a sign that something is going on in that house. And, and some of you are going to go home and mow because I, <laughs> I, I said that. Um, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, if, if something's going on and, and you just begin to pray and, uh, and see, you don't, I usually don't knock on the door and say, hey, what's going on? You know, that's not what I do. But, but uh, uh, you, you, you see those and, and how you can serve. But not only serve them, but I want you to hear this. This is a very important. Allow them to serve you. Don't, don't think you're Superman in your neighborhood. Allow them to serve you. Because... Even people that are pre-Christian, and I didn't share this at the beginning of the message, there is a scale known as the Engel scale. And they, a guy by the name of Dr. James Engel came up with it. It's a continuum, uh, and there's a point on that continuum where somebody comes to Christ, okay? They come to Christ at that point, and then there's two sides to that point. This side is pre-Christian. Maybe they, they come from uh, not having any thoughts about God at all till slowly they come, somebody talks to them, and they come to that point of their seeing their need, and they come to Christ, and then it's the growth in, in Christ until they go to glory. But there, there comes a point. And so, uh, you know, what do we call people that are on this side of the continuum? Often we'll use terms like lost and pagan or, or whatever we use. Sometimes they, those sound a little rough. Uh, but maybe we, we consider them, we're going to be optimistic here, we're going to call them pre-Christian. Pre-Christian. Till, till they come to that point of knowing Christ and growing in their faith. Well, people who are even pre-Christian know that serving gives them a good feeling. And they open up in serving. Actually, you release something called oxytocin. Write that down. That, that, tweet that out, oxytocin. But there's a good feeling that comes from serving. And so allow your neighbors to serve you. I am not the most mechanically inclined guy in the world. I'm just not. Uh, I, I will jump into anything, but I can't put it back together once I take it apart. That's just the way I'm wired. So if I have a need in that area, I'll call one of my neighbors. Or uh, I, let's say I got to haul something um, and, and I, a neighbor's got pickup trucks. I'm able to talk to them. I think this is Mark. I think sometimes God allows us to have weaknesses so we'll have to depend on other people. And sometimes it's just our neighbor's. And it gives them a feeling of, hey, 
this guy is normal guy. He screws up, he messes up, and I can help him. And so we, we serve one another uh, doing that. So if you're with me, begin with prayer, eat, uh, excuse me, listen, eat, serve. And the last S is this, share your story. Share your story. One of the most powerful tools you have is your story of how Jesus Christ saved you and how he redeemed you. Maybe you had a marriage that was on the rocks and the Lord restored. Maybe you had a teenager who rebelled or you rebelled and the Lord brought you home. Listen, nobody can take your story away from you. It's the most powerful thing you have about how Christ changed your life. Share struggles, share warts and all. Be, be willing to be transparent and authentic. And pray that God will give you divine appointments. You never know when they're going to come. That's the whole deal. You, wanna, you want it to be part of your life. You, you live following Jesus. It's not just a Sunday thing. It's a Monday through Sunday thing. And, and you want to follow Christ. And you want to live it out. You fail. You stub your toe. You, you fall down sometimes. You, you got to get up. But you, Lord, give me divine appointments with my neighbors. Now, um, it was a couple of months ago. We had a neighbor that was moving away. And I hate, to, I hate to have people move from our neighborhood. It gives us new people, but, but I, I just love our neighbors. And, and uh, so um, this family was moving away. And, and, and I'd been just really thinking, Lord, uh, uh, man, I, I would really love to just pray with them. You know, I'd, I'd been asking that ever since I'd lived there. And I'm sitting out on the front porch and in the rocking chair, and I'm reading. And uh, uh, he came home. They were they were in the process of moving, and so he came home at that point. And you know what the Lord does? He always takes you up on your prayers. And uh, basically, he said, "This this is a good time." And and I was making excuses. Do you mind? You, you ever do that? Oh, they're busy. Uh, this kind of stuff, and and uh, and the Lord said, "Are you gonna go or not?" And uh, and I, I so I put my book down, walk down the street, go up to the house. He's the only one at home. I knock on the door, and and he answers. And uh, I said, "Shia, man, I I just want you to know, y'all are gonna be missed so much in our neighborhood. I, I, I hate to see you go." You, you and your wife have done a great job with your kids, and, and uh, I just wanted to come before you left and, and just pray over you if that was okay. He slammed the door in my face. No, not, not really. <laughs> the, the reason he didn't think it was odd is because we had a relationship. And I was able to put an arm around him and just pray over him. And he was so grateful just for that what I'm saying is is that as you build relationships authentic genuine loving relationships why would you not want to share the greatest thing in your life with them I want to end with uh, an illustration because I think it's vital and I hope it's motivating for you there's a picture uh, a painting that's been done. Does anybody know what the, this painting is called? No? Uh, I do. Uh, it's called the Salvatore Mundi. It is currently the highest priced painting that, has, that is out there. It was done by Leonardo da Vinci, and it sells currently for 450 million dollars I mean good night that doesn't look that good <laughs> but 450 million dollars for that painting it's probably in France somewhere I didn't do enough digging but uh, suppose that you're in France okay and you're walking around 
in Paris and you see a dumpster and you come upon that dumpster and uh, you look in that dumpster and you see something that looks like a painting but it's muddy and some of the canvas is torn on it and you look, you look in there and you're thinking, my goodness, that looks like a muddy painting. So you pick it up and you brush away some of the mud and you see that it's the genuine picture, the genuine portrait that has been painted here. And you see that and you think, man, look at this thing though. And, you know, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to just put it back in the dumpster? You're saying, man, that thing is muddy. I'm not going to... No, what you do is you take it to somebody and they can completely restore it, take the mud off, fix the canvas, and completely restore this masterpiece that has been painted. So the question is, as you look in that dumpster, do you see the masterpiece or do you see the mud? What do you see when you look at it? The same question we need to ask as we see our neighbors and those closest around us. You see, there's nothing in all creation that matches the creation of humans. We were even created above the angels in heaven. God so loved us that He created us in His very image. And this is what he did. So l l look around the room. We are all masterpieces. But when we look at our neighbors, do we see the mud or do we see the masterpiece? Because if we see that they're masterpieces that it's happened to be muddy, we need to take them to somebody who can reproduce and reform and take care of them so they can become the masterpiece that is worth $450 million that's priceless. And that person is the master himself, Jesus. But we got to love them by seeing the masterpiece and not the mud. Some of you can't even look in the mirror and see the masterpiece. Because others... I've just said you're mud. You're not worth much. Listen, I want you to know that God, the Master, so loved you that He gave His only Son that whoever would believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You're a masterpiece. 